Welcome to you all today. I'm Paul Pepys, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. Today we're in the Barker Gallery at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. My guests are Akiko Wally and Anne Rose Kitagawa. Akiko Wally is the Maud I. Kearns Assistant Professor of Japanese Art in the Department of the History of Art and Architecture at the University of Oregon. Anne Rose Kitagawa is the Chief Curator of Collections in Asian Art and the Director of Academic Programs at UO's Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art. Wally and Kitagawa co-curated Expanding Frontiers, the Jack and Susie Wadsworth collection of post-war Japanese prints, currently on view in this gallery at the museum. Thanks both for coming on the show. Thank you for inviting us. So the Jack and Susie Wadsworth collection, what is it and why is it significant? So in 2012, the museum was very fortunate to be able to acquire a major collection of 157 modern and contemporary Japanese prints representing various artists, um, actually 77 artists and different schools and many different techniques. Um, this is a transformative gift for the art museums and makes possible for us to represent and for Professor Wally to teach about all different types of contemporary Japanese prints. How, tell us about the collections, the Asian collections that are here and how this collection supplements those or expands those. So are we now the foremost museum on the academic museum on the West Coast with this kind of material? I mean, it's, let's talk a little bit about the other Asian collections and how this works with them. Our museum was actually founded as Museum of Asian Art, which does make us quite different. Um, it was founded by a woman named Gertrude Bess Warner who lived and traveled in Asia, collected Chinese, Korean, and Japanese art. And because of her legacy collection, which came to us originally in the 1920s, um, we have good representation of traditional Japanese woodblock prints, or ukiyo-e, images of the floating world, and to a certain extent, early 20th century Japanese prints that represent the continuation of those genres of uh, landscape and figural prints. Um, but we really didn't have so much in the way of modern and contemporary. Um, we did have a major gift from Yoko McLean, However, this is, a, as I said, an amazing opportunity for us to expand what we can teach. So say a little bit more about the relationship of this kind of work to those Japanese prints, the woodblock prints that have been here. What's different about these? How, how are they unlike those? Um, well, Japanese, the history of woodblock print in Japan goes back a long way. Um, one of the earliest printed material uh, that remains in the world is in Japan, and that's the seven, uh, 770 uh, print, Buddhist print. So it started off as a prim primarily religious um, communication tool. However, in uh, the 17th century onward, it became a commercial tool for communication. So it had a very long history, but during the early modern period, which is between 1615 to 1868 in Japan, it was primarily woodblock print, and it was created through um, a workshop. So there was a publisher who commissioned the designer to design, and then the design was sent to the printer to print, and then to the carver to carve, and then it was printed, and it was sold by the publisher. So it was more of an artisanal collaboration. But what happened uh, in the modern period with the advent of Western style of education and art uh, f theories. People started to produce works by self-designing, self-carving, and self-printing. So it was called the creative print movement and it became very prevalent in the early 20th century. So by produce, uh, doing all of the steps on their own, they claimed themselves as artists and that is the major break between what was going on in the early modern period and what started to go on after the modern period. So in this earlier period, almost all woodblock prints? Yes. So in the period that the Wadsworth collection covers, are they mostly woodblocks? Well, what is uh, magnificent about the Wadsworth collection is that, yes, it includes some of the most important and most um, renowned pieces of woodblock print in the 20th and 21st century, but it also expands to uh, intaglio, lithography, and screen printing. And those are 
new types of prints that started to become popular in Japan after the modern period. But when we think about Japanese print in the contemporary context, even in a scholarly context, what people often think about is the Japanese woodblock print. So although it was something that was going on in Japan and artists were experimenting with these new techniques, um, it has never been really featured um, in particularly in the uh, Western understanding of Japanese print. Now the, the JSMA is a, a academic museum, so it has an educational mission. And I know that there are many aspects uh, of the show that are related to the educational mission, but let's start with the preparation for the show and the way that our students were involved in that process. So you, there were two classes, so tell me about those two classes and tell me about the participation of the students in the process. So as you mentioned, we are a teaching museum and we're delighted to have student involvement in all aspects of our production. Um, this was a very special opportunity for us because it was brand new material and so the students got to roll up their sleeves and work with us to catalog and inventory the collections. So um, in addition to doing research on objects, we kind of pulled back the curtain so that they could see behind what goes on behind the scenes in an art museum in order to plan an exhibition. And um, Professor Wally is our poster child as far as <laughs> faculty are concerned. She has been deeply invested in teaching with original objects and every year we put out Japanese gallery rotations that cater to her classes so that her students can write their papers about original works that they can see here in the art museums. But for this particular project, um, she actually taught two courses. So I'll let you talk about this. <laughs> so the first one in the fall? The first one was in the fall of 2014. And it was a course, experimental course, developed with the um, support from the Tom and Carol Williams Fund. And it featured the techniques. So what we did was we collaborated with the, um, the museum, but also with the art department, Charlene Liu and Mika Boyd so that students are not only hearing my lecture, um, but also looking at the object in the museum and going to the art studios to actually experience creating the prints for all relief print, lithography, intaglio, and screen printing so that they will be able to not only observe what they see, but also talk about the prints from the perspective of the artist. And the course in the winter of 2015 is the course that we collaborated, uh, which is geared much more towards exhibition planning and understanding how the museum works. So we were looking at the works from the Wordsworth Collection closely, but we um, kind of threw the students off the deep end and let them do most of the research and present on their materials so that they are more, um, in a way, empowered by having to do all this research. And at the same time, they were uh, communicating with museum staff, as well as curators from Portland, to learn about how to conceptualize a, an exhibition. So you guys had a mock-up of the gallery space with the students. And they were like literally putting little Xeroxes of all the art in various places trying to figure out how to organize the show. One of the most exciting days, we taped everything out on two tables and it was chaos and it was fun because lots of staff members were peering in from the windows of what's going on in there. But it was so exciting because they got to use what they had learned. They had spent a great deal of time analyzing special exhibitions. They had talked to collectors, to artists, to um, you know, dealers to all sorts of museum staff here and really started thinking about, well, if I want to draw people into the collection, I want to have a vista wall that really invites them in and is interesting and, you know, surprise them as you go around that wall. And, and it was great when we took them on a field trip and they were thinking like curators. We have, we have changed the way that they will encounter exhibitions everywhere that they go. And not only thinking like curators, so there's a beautiful catalog that goes with the show. And there are um, essays about specific works that are written by these students, yes? Exactly. 13 of the students who participated in a class continued to participate after the class was over. So they not only came up with catalog entries and these ch wonderful chat labels, but they did a talk for the exhibition interpreters. Um, and also on the opening day, many of them 
came back and presented a gallery tour, uh, gallery, gallery talk for the visitors. So their involvement is quite, is quite <laughs> deep. <laughs> so tell, tell us a little bit about how you and they finally organized the exhibition. So you say there's uh, hun over 150 pieces of artwork from this large chunk of historical time. So how did you do it? How did you organize? How did, how, how did you figure that out? Well, sadly, we couldn't include everything. So um, curatorship is all about choices. And some of the choices that we made were to be a little bit bossy in the way that the exhibition begins. Um, usually, we have a gallery where there are four different entrances. And so um, it's always possible that people are going to come in from a different door than you might expect. So we had to put text panels near the main doors at the tops of our stairwells. But we wanted very much for people who did want a chronological uh, presentation to have the option of coming up what we consider to be sort of the main entrance, which is the south entrance. And um, there we have um, situated some of the pioneering prints by the Sosaku Hanga, or creative printmakers, um, with enough background to kind of set the ideological tone for the exhibition. Because in addition to what Professor Wally was saying about the difference in workshop production, there were really class associations with traditional Japanese prints that it was important to address at the beginning of the exhibition, mm -hmm. that um, traditional ukiyo-e definitely had merchant class associations. And even though Western artists and collectors of all different classes enjoyed them, it was really not something that upper class Japanese people were supposed to like. Hmm. And so um, it was important to kind of set the tone that the Sosaku Hanga printmakers were trying to distinguish themselves from that tradition. And um, I think we were able to do that. And at a certain point, it becomes less about a school or a time period and more about the aesthetics. Because of the 157 objects, I believe 109 of them are on view right now, representing 67 of the 77 artists in the collection. So there is a chronological organization, but there are other ways, there are other factors. So what are some of the other ways that this stuff is organized? I know, for example, there's one section where you put up extra walls to create an intimate space because those prints are very small. So are there, talk about some of the other strategies that you use. So this is the space that is mostly chronological. We have a separate room that is dedicated to Gaston Petit, who was um, uh, an important figure in not only uh, as an artist, but also as, as somebody who promoted the Japanese print designers of this period. Um, as we move towards Can the I just northern... interrupt you? Just tell us who that guy is. Mm -hmm. who, who, who is he? He's still around. Yes. So uh, Gaston Petit is a um, French-Canadian friar of the Dominican order who moved to Japan in the early 1960s and was there, um, he had learned printmaking in Canada, and while there he had a printmaking studio in which he produced his own prints, produced prints for other artists, and taught a number of artists who were interested in the newer printmaking technologies of lithography and screen printing, um, how to use the materials. And so he developed strong ties with many artists, and it is actually from Gaston Petit that the Wadsworths were able to acquire a little bit more than half of their collection. And that's remarkable in that he had great ties with important people in the field. And um, in one fell swoop, they ended up with this amazing teaching collection, which Petit documented because he was there when a lot of these prints were born. And, um, and he wrote a number of books intended for a Western audience. And as an artist, he was really focused on technique. And so it is thanks to him that we have really exhaustive explanations of how some of these prints were created. So I interrupted you. Mm -hmm. So you were about to say, uh, you, you started talking about him, but I think you were going to say about some of the other groups of artists. Or I mean, I know, for example, there are certain walls where there's a bunch of work by one artist. Mm -hmm. You want to say a little mm -hmm. bit more about that? So the other loose organizations that we try to uh, come up, one was the technique. So the catalog uh, featuring the four basic techniques of printmaking in this exhibition was something that was very important to us. And the catalog is organized by techniques. So we have a wall that uh, summarizes the four main techniques. And some of the walls are generally clustered, for instance, by 
works done in screen print. But there are other wall walls that feature certain artists. For instance, um, there is a wall that features right here an artist named Saito Kiyoshi who uh, mostly worked on relief print, but there is also a wall that is dedicated to Kusama Yayoi, Yayoi who, is the 1920, who was born in 1929 and one of the most in internationally renowned Japanese artists who also worked uh, quite extensively in uh, printmaking, but her print print, uh, print printed works are not as as valued or featured as some of his her other works. So we have a wall dedicated to her piece. Um, and also, going back to the idea of education and class, many of the works that we chose to include in the show were the pieces that students thought were important. So the students were researching the artist as we move through the term. So the choices that students made at the end of the term were informed choices. So we tried to um, uh, value their opinions. So there are many pieces that are you know, really students pick. I know um, that as is always the case with JSMA shows, there's a very large swatch of um, community outreach, educational outreach programs. Tell us about some of those. What are some of the things that are, are being done around this exhibit? Well, I'm happy to say that we have student-run tours that will be happening on um, October 14th, which is a Wednesday, and November 14th, which is a Saturday. And that's an opportunity for other people to hear the wonderful erudition that our students were able to come up with, um, including some of the works that are in the catalog, but with additional works. We are very fortunate through the F Spencer Foundation to have internships for students to continue their research. And I'm so glad that a lot of the students were really enthusiastic to keep doing that. Some of them, I think, we're going to have to shoo out of the exhibition <laughs> because they're so excited <laughs> To, I mean, they really seem empowered, and I think that's the most gratifying thing, watching them, you know, deal with new material and, you know, overcome whatever inhibitions and really own it. And it's, it's so exciting to hear them speak. And when the Wadsworths told the students, I learned so much from your presentation, it was just fantastic. <laughs> I know that uh, as part of the exhibition, you are bringing one of the artists here to demonstrate techniques. Tell us about who that is and when that's happening. So uh, the artist we are very excited to invite, um, his name is Hamanishi Katsunori. Uh, he is a contemporary mezzotint artist uh, who works in Japan but also teaches in Japan. So mezzotint is a technique that was invented in around 17th century in France, but something that um, slowly died out by the 20th century, and it was something very important to the history of Japanese print because uh, early artists who were working in France in the early part of the 20th century were responsible in part to reviving the technique. And Hamanishi Katsunori works uh, in this tradition. Um, and the mezzotint as a technique, what you will do is to have an intaglio plate, so the metal plate, and you use this tool called a rocker to create these burr um, all over the plate that will then be varnished to create this uh, beautiful velvety black. And it is a very uh, uh, onerous, uh, work intensive technique. And we are very fortunate, but because of that, not many students here um, engage in the technique. So we're very fortunate to have him come and demonstrate his technique. How long will he be here for? He will be he here. He comes on a Sunday, Sunday. and he stays I think he departs on a Thursday. Mm -hmm. So he'll be doing student programs, a demonstration, private for students, a public talk here at the museum. Um, so we are very fortunate to have him coming. Very excited. That's cool. What are, were there any particular challenges mounting this show that are unusual? Well, it's a huge volume of material. It all belongs to us. Much of it is large format. Our prep crew worked tirelessly to mat and frame enormous um, prints, some of them with some conservation issues. Um, we have one particular double-sided print that needed to be framed in an ingenious double-sided frame, mm -hmm. which um, I'm glad to say because of the show we will have now in perpetuity so we can show it again. 
Um, but also the challenge of you have essentially a bowling alley that you have all of these like-sized objects to fit in. And so we needed to figure out a way to divide it up so that it would provide interest and surprise and allow the very quiet pieces to be in an area where they were not harmed by some of the more outrageous colors and patterns of some of the later prints. So, um, but I felt as though we learned a lot from the students' experimentation with exhibition planning, and um, we did affect a number of the, the strategies that they came mm -hmm. up with, so. Yeah. And also, um, the challenge, one of the challenges was to decide what to leave out. Mm -hmm. Early on in the planning process, we came to the conclusion that because of the limitation of space, we will not be able to include all of the prints. So we had to leave something out and how to choose to leave something out when everything is so good. Um, and the other uh, challenge was um, we wanted to feature technique, but how to um, edu uh, come up with some sort of educational um, uh, panel or uh, explanation on the technique that will be uh, easy for the viewer to understand because just by walking around the gallery, some of them, it is very difficult to tell immediately how the print was produced. So um, what we have is an iPad um, uh, screen uh, towards the other end of the gallery uh, that features one of the print, that is this Michael uh, that's behind us, that student recreated the printing process and it goes through step by step. Yeah, that's very interesting. I should say one of the challenges for the show in general was that when you have the words Japanese and print in the title of anything, it calls to mind the traditional Japanese woodblock prints. And so we felt that it was a little bit um, optimistic of us to assume <laughs> that people would walk in and say, oh, Sosaku Hanga, terrific. Um, and in fact, I think it is kind of an educational obstacle. And we hope that people will come in and think, wow, I had no idea that there were all of these novel things going on in Japan. And, and we have toyed with the idea of should Japanese have been in the title? Because of course it is a show of Japanese prints, but what unifies them is they are stunning, stellar, superb prints. And I think for any printmakers, there it's a feast for the eyes here. It's, um, my benchmark for these shows is always our prep crew, many of whom are artists. And when they come up to my office and say, how in the world did Waco make this lithograph? I make lithographs and I, I can't figure out how it's possible to do it perfectly over and over again. Um, that's always a good sign, so. So you just described a wonderful um, response of an artist to mm -hmm. the work. You are both scholars of this material. So maybe it's fair to say that in Eugene, Oregon, you know more about this stuff than anybody else who's here. What did you learn from this process? Is there anything that you saw, anything that you encountered where you said, what? I had no idea. I think so much about some of the other techniques. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've spent most of my life looking at traditional Japanese prints and the sort of evocation of them or divergence from them in Sosaku Hanga. But the fact that there are these lithographs, they're screen prints, they're intaglio prints, and then mixed media works. And that, you know, Japanese artists, Japanese art historians look at Japanese art. Japanese artists don't limit themselves to looking at Japanese art. <laughs> And the fact that these people were as interested in Kandinsky or Andy Warhol or you know, things that really made me stretch beyond my normal boundaries was great. I mean, it's always fun. For me, my knowledge of Japanese print um, is much more vast in the Edo period, the mm -hmm. early mm -hmm. modern period. Mm -hmm. And there are quite a few works in the exhibition that actually um, hark back to the early modern tradition. Mm -hmm. And some of those, I, at the beginning, I foolishly thought that I got it figured out <laughs> and I knew what was going on. But at one point in the planning process, we had the opportunity to speak with a conservator um, who was also trained um, professionally in printmaking. And some of the materials that people were using in the 20th century, although it looked like early modern print, it was completely different contemporary uh, chemical that I don't even know how to pronounce. So that was very um, eye-opening. 
how, I know that the show's only been up for a couple of week now, weeks now. How has it been received by the community so far? Happily, I haven't seen people walk in, not see Hokusai and Hiroshige and walk out. <laughs> um, I think that they seem pleased and interested, perhaps slightly perplexed, but um, you know, we're set up with great material, so there's no shortage of really amazing prints that we can use for our advertisements, and I think you know, these prints sell themselves. Prints do sell themselves, generally, and you know, having a full wall of Kiyoshi Saito or a full wall of Shinoda Toko, um, the Kusama things, um, you know, I, I think there's a lot to love, and no matter what someone's taste is, I dare say there's something in this gallery that will speak to it. The exhibit is going on for two more months, is that right? Through mm -hmm. January 3rd. So after it closes, will there be other opportunities to see the collection? Are there any plans? Talk about that. Well, I mean, I should mention that one of the challenges that we had with the show is the Wadsworth Collection includes Japanese printmakers and four expat Western artists who live and work in Japan. And that was something of a quandary for us of where do we put those artists. So right now those artists are featured in a small installation in our Japanese gallery along with other Western artists who lived and worked in Asia. So um, we have our regular Japanese galleries and the Wadsworth prints have been cycling through those galleries ever since they got here. But um, this was the first opportunity we had to show the lion's share. And um, now that everything is matted, it makes it possible for us to do so much more. So yes. I think we'll see a lot more of them. Yeah. And also, um, one of the wonderful things I find about the Wasp Collection is that there are many themes so that you can divide up the collection based on, for instance, the concept of time and mm -hmm. space or you know, connection to religion. And so there will be many opportunities to divide the collection and cater to a class and show to students in different contexts than this um, magnificent exhibition. Well, that's, that's a good place for us to stop. We're just about out of time. I want to thank you both for taking the time to speak with us today. I've been speaking with Akiko Wali, the Maud I. Kearns Assistant Professor of Japanese Art in the Department of the History of Art and Architecture at the University of Oregon, and Anne Rose Kitagawa, the Chief Curator of Collections in Asian Art and the Director of Academic Programs at the UO's Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art, Expanding Frontiers, the Jack and Susie Wadsworth Collection of Postwar Japanese Prints is on view at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art through January 3rd, 2016. I urge you to come see it. It's amazing. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you.